Welcome, everybody, to another edition of Millennials Are Killing Capitalism Live. First, Monica, thank you for becoming a YouTube member. Appreciate it a lot. Um, make sure you like the video, of course. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And check out all the other content we have on here. I think we're up to 88 videos on here in the last six months. Um, and uh yeah share share the share the stream invite people in tell a friend do that before or after or during um so today we have a conversation with kai heron um we're going to be talking about his recent piece forget eco modernism which is um on the verso website um kai heron is a lecturer in political ecology at Lancaster University and the co-editor of the, I don't know how to pronounce this press, De Gruyter, we'll, we'll get clarification on that, Handbook of Degrowth, um, which just recently came out. Um, and so, yeah, so we're going to talk about this piece, which obviously is uh, advocating that it's time to move beyond eco-modernism. We'll talk a little bit about obviously give folks some backdrop of what eco-modernism is and um, uh, talk about degrowth a little bit, of course, and talk about um, specific strands of, of degrowth, I think, a little bit as well. Um, and so it's an important conversation right now. Obviously, um, it, you know, I, to bring in a recent reference yesterday, Hillary Clinton tweeted out a graph that said, hey, this is the most important election. She didn't say exactly this, but paraphrasing, this is everything's at stake in this election. Vote for Trump or Biden and then showed a graph that showed that everybody on the planet would be dead. And, you know, by 2050, with regardless of whoever you voted for. So it was quite a, a self own of the Democratic Party and, um, you know, incrementalism uh, around climate and capitalism, obviously, in the climate. And um so anyways, uh, we'll we'll get into the the strains of political ecology that um, actually have a, an opportunity to um, make this planet livable for, you know, as long as we can and at the best sort of level that we can. Um, so I know that's very important to to all of us. And, um, you know, we're also going to draw in some connections, obviously, with Palestine as well, since a lot of our conversations have been around that so anyways that, that's just what i'll say up front uh kai welcome to the show i hope i miss i didn't mispronounce your last name i i didn't know you got it right i, I okay. like seeing the various pronunciations i get and i i <laughs> think the greater the de greater handbook of deep yeah okay right on uh well welcome uh it's great to be in conversation with you i've Thank been you. kind of following your presence on online for a while and appreciate um you know really all of the work that I have seen you do, um, you know, and so definitely somebody I recommend people um, follow, pay attention to your work and, um, you know, critically engage with or positively engage with or whatever else. Um, and so, you know, to get into this, um, you know, you we're, we're here to talk about first and foremost, this piece that you just recently published, which is called Forget Eco-Modernism. Um, the title obviously explains <laughs> the purpose of it pretty well, um, I think. But could you just start by laying out a little bit of what kind of brought you to writing this piece now in this moment? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think there are a couple of things. Uh, maybe one of them is kind of conjunctural. So uh, a thing about the moment we're in. And the other one is kind of a personal, more personal story. So I'll start with a conjunctural one and then I can do the personal bit after. And they obviously relate. The conjunctural thing, you mentioned Palestine, and it, it really, that is in the background of this text from the beginning, right? So as it begins for a couple of years now, I don't know, five years at least, it feels like longer. Uh, we have been on the kind of eco-socialist left, uh, what I put as locked into orbit around the debate, right, between eco-modernism on one side and degrowth on the other. And I'm, I'm sure we'll go down and drill into what those are in a little bit. And that debate has been useful in lots of ways, right? The debate has helped us understand the terms of different kinds of ecological strategies in the Imperial Corps. Um, and it's played out across various magazines and pages online and in journals. So Jacobin, Monthly Review, uh, Spectre Magazine and others. And 
that debate has been useful, um, but at the moment when uh, the, the climate movement needs to think about how to come to terms with the severity of the crisis we're in and how to mobilize in response to a genocide in Palestine and ongoing incursions on uh, lands and labor in the global south, uh, I essentially just don't think that eco-modernism has an answer to those questions. And that, that's what animated the piece first and foremost. So that's the conjunctural bit, right? It's It's been good for a while to engage and debate uh, with the eco-modernist tradition, but I think it really doesn't have answers to the ecological crisis. Um, as a thing to bounce off of, it's been very useful because it helps us come to terms with our own position, but that's over. And I think it's completely useless and in fact, worse than useless on Palestine. And we can talk about that in a bit. Um, so that's, that's the conjunctural reason for forgetting eco-modernism. And then the idea behind that is not that degrowth wins. I'm not actually a degrowth proponent, and I hope we can go into that as well. But that by forgetting eco-modernism, we can have a more interesting and diverse discussion about eco-socialist or left environmental strategies and struggles. So that's the kind of conjunctural. And then the personal is, you, you mentioned it, but I've just finished editing that, that degrowth handbook, um, which was really useful for me to come to terms with what degrowth is, my own relation to it. Um, and working through those debates of eco-modernism and degrowth, I've just <laughs> just become fed up with it myself, right? I find, find it increasingly uh, not a productive space, and I'm much more interested in thinking about uh, eco-socialist strategy, theories of revolutionary transition, uh, which again, I, I don't think eco-modernism can help with. So for me, it was kind of a, this is the last thing I'm going to say about this debate, and I'm just going to move on. I appreciate that, and I think there's a you know, one, I think that what you're describing, too, in terms of also how people feel about this debate is something that a lot of people have uh, feel at this point, too, is sort of like, OK, this has been there's been a lot of debate about this in a lot of different um, journals for the last, you know, five years, especially. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's interesting. There's there's things that, you know, like you say, that you can learn from different arguments and traditions, um, you know, it's not. It's not an all, you know, one or the other kind of thing in some respects, but also like in, one engaging in the debate isn't actually that productive. And I don't think anymore. And two, um, as you say, I kind of tend to agree. Um, and I think I come to some of these conclusions through engagement with Max Isle's work as well, mm -hmm. uh, that like, you know, a lot of the work that gets described as eco-modernism or that claims to be eco modernism or whatever like just really doesn't um it doesn't feel to me like it is seriously uh engages with the actual um the actual problems in ways that i can see you know a kind of trajectory or you know um so anyways we'll get into that a little bit more so let's do start <laughs> yeah let's let's do that i mean like well first let's just do some definition or some sure. like you know, basic, um, you know, political ecology explanation for folks of like what, what is uh, eco modernism and kind of what are some of the basic um, arguments in it that you, um, you know, that you have criticisms of and and disagree mm -hmm. with, but also, um, you know, what are the? I know, as you said, you're not an actual proponent of degrowth but maybe say some of the aspects of degrowth that you think are more worth uh, engagement or consideration or inclusion within uh, uh, left eco-socialist politics. Yeah, sure. Yeah, those two go hand in hand. So eco-modernism, uh, it's a term that one or two of them uh, identified with for a little bit first. It's not, it's not used in a derogatory way. So Matthew Huber, for example, identifies, I think, with eco-modernism as, as an assertive project. Um, but in my piece, I'm very careful to distinguish between left eco-modernism and what I think of as just capitalism's answer to the climate crisis is eco-modernism. So maybe I start there. It's rolling out techno fixes, you know, um, kind of the techno fixes to the ecological crises that we face uh, that don't change anything systemic, right, about social property relations, north-south polarization, whatever. A left eco-modernism isn't that. It says, but it borrows some of those ideas. So it says, look, we need to abolish capitalism, but the way we abolish capitalism uh, essentially is through technological advances towards things that are 
uh, large scale technologies and in industries. So nuclear power, uh, the expansion of uh, land saving uh, conventional agricultural systems, uh, that's that kind of thing, right? So big modernist projects. And the argument is that this is what it means to be a Marxist, that Marx thought that capitalism laid the groundwork for a post-capitalist society. All that is needed essentially is for the workers to take control of the means of production, right? So on one level, yeah, that, that is a very conventional reading of, of, of Marxism. Uh, it takes its cues more, I think, from people like Kautsky than it does from people like Lenin or Marx, in fact. But so aside from the point, that's what eco-modernism, broadly speaking, is. My problems with it, uh, <laughs> I wrote down a list in advance, so I'm going to be looking at it. This, I'll go through five, um, but, but quickly. So one is, I mentioned in the article, is that I think it's ecologically illiterate. So it tends to make this move very often when you read the pieces, and they're primarily in places like Jacobin, which I think has given eco-modernism kind of an overinflated influence, because we're only really talking about four or five people who write these pieces. Um, but in any case, ecological illiteracy. So it kind of denies that any new thinking around ecology is significant or may need us to revise the thinking uh, and lessons from traditional Marxist theory, Marx in particular. And so it tends to appeal to authority and say, look, all of the answers to the ecological crisis already existed in Marx. This is very clear in Matthew Huber and Lee Phillips's piece that mine responded to. Uh, and so with that comes a denial with new, of new ecological science and advances, including things about uh, socially and ecologically constructed kind of barriers and thresholds that it would be inadvisable to cross. So something like there are energetic limits to how much energy is in the system of the pl planetary system that we can access sustainably without destroying the conditions for a livable planet. Degrowth, we'll get there in a minute, but that recognizes those limits and boundaries, right? recognizes that they're socially constructed to an extent, um, but nevertheless says we need to live within them. Ecomondism denies that. So in Huber and Phillips's piece, they talk about space mining, you know, like in a kind of Elon Musk style way. There's no limit to what we can do. Humans are completely ingenious. We'll just launch ourselves into space and get the minerals, resources, and energy that we need, right? I, I think that's a kind of ecological illiteracy. Uh, the other important one, denial of value drains or the uneven ecological exchange. So it's uh, a regular feature of their work to say that the global North working class is exploited. This is true, but that that exploitation doesn't happen, uh, isn't part of a global system that also and disproportionately exploits the lands and labor of the global South to extract value to the global core. So a theory of imperialism, a theory of value transfer, surplus drain, whatever language you want to use. That's denied by eco-modernism. And I think that's a, a mistake. I think we'll get to this later, but it's a strategic mistake, not just a conceptual mistake. Uh, then a flawed understanding of technology. So with this idea that we can just grab hold of the forces of production as they exist and wield them towards socialist ends, there's a denial of the idea that technology has a politics imbued in it. So a lot of critical studies of technology show the particular technologies reproduce particular subjects, forms of consciousness, or ways of organizing our social life. And so certain technologies uh, are not, or do not incline themselves towards communistic ends. Um, so an example, conventional agriculture is kind of a labor saving strategy. Um, it's not only is it ecologically damaging, but it's quite isolating for agricultural laborers. Whereas agroecological food systems, which obviously Max Iyer and others have written a lot about, uh, are collective endeavors. They are not profitable for capital because they're labor intensive, but they lessen the you know, individual work and responsibility of food production. They're more communistic in their form of organization. But it, it's interesting that you know, eco-modernism denies agroecology and leans on the side of conventional agriculture. Uh, and I'll just do one more because I'm going on for ages. But <laughs> there's a kind of a convergence with uh, that I'm increasingly concerned with is a convergence with reactionary forms of conservatism that recognizes the need for uh, trade unions, that recognizes the need for working class power, but that argues for this for the sake of saving capital from itself. So people like Saurabh Omari and Compact Magazine are a good place to go for this. 
Eco-modernism uh, or eco-modernists have been publishing in reactionary outlets for a while now. So Matt Huber wrote for Unheard, which has an a article about why Enoch Powell is a visionary. Enoch Powell, for people from who don't know him, was a fascist. Um, you know, so we, I don't think we should be writing for magazines that praise fascists. And I think if you do, you're saying something about the people you're wanting to reach out to, connect with and build an alliance with. And then Lee Phillips wrote a piece against parts of the Palestinian left for Compact magazine, which is known to have an anti-trans editorial line. It's got a Zionist editor and a Zionist editorial line. And that piece is ex directly attacking the left, right? Which I think is certainly gonna be published there because it's advantageous to Zionist interests. So I see this alliance, this class alliance um, of eco-modernism with a reactionary project of essentially national imperialist renewal in the global north is extremely worrisome. Uh, Eco-modernists like to challenge degrowth for being a middle class movement, a movement that doesn't speak to the needs of the working classes. So they're doing a kind of class analysis of where it's emerged from. And I think we should do the same back, right? We need to say, well, wait, what are the class interests that eco-modernism is advancing? And do we want to support that? Um, so I think I make a major mistake when there. Okay, that's eco-modernism. <laughs> I can go into your know, degrowth. Or... I, I just want to make one comment yeah. before we move to degrowth, because as you're right. talking about this, you're also highlighting something that has really, um, I, well, it's not exactly the same, but I think it's 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 a related thing that's going on within the United States, right? Which is that there's a lot of folks consider themselves you know, on the left, I, many of them, I think, are, but I think they're misguided on this, um, that, you know, would say or have said, maybe they're saying it less now because of the genocide that Joe Biden is is fully supporting to the tune of, you know, billions and billions, tens of billions of dollars, you know, constantly. Um, but they, you know, have said, hey, look, Biden has been really good to labor. He also hasn't done um, what we need in terms of climate policy, but he is, you know, trying or taking some steps or, you know, whatever. And like, there's this very interesting thing because there is a, um, well, I, it, some people think it's overstated a little bit, but there is a kind of labor upsurge and uh, a renewal in a country, frankly, that where labor has been totally decimated, honestly, um, you know, over the last 40 years or so in terms of percentage of jobs and everything else, you know. Um, and I think that's good. And I think a lot of people within um, the labor movements, younger folks, organizers are also um, working to build a labor movement that express is able to express more solidarity with mm -hmm. um you know uh global south movements things like palestine i mean i the folks who just were at labor notes i saw a lot of good stuff coming out of that um conference just in terms of uh where the organizers and people who were at that kind of were on questions of global solidarity and stuff like that so those are all good signs i don't want to um mm -hmm. diminish those good signs but it is concerning to me that you know, it, it still becomes these questions of like, you know, how much do you want to align with someone like Joe Biden, who is, <laughs> you know, a, a fascist in my view on sort of everything, uh, but may, but is also very vocally. I mean, I, his ads in the United States, I see at this point, he knows that he's losing on basically every other issue. And so he's leaning even more into uh, getting union organizers to talk about how great he has been for unions and creating jobs and bringing stuff back and da 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 da. And so this exactly. is this is this alliance too of like okay, you have a declining empire and there's a recognition that there's going to need to be more of a labor force uh, within the United States than was necessary 20, 30 years ago, and also like so so you're okay with promoting a certain level of unionization and labor and such so on on the terms of we still are going to maintain you know kind of this overarching imperialist you know policy even if it may be limited to you know regionally limited in ways that it wasn't 
as much in the past, or maybe not, because maybe we'll go out, we'll go to war with China or something like that. But yeah. anyway, um, no, the, the, I just, that's, that's exactly yeah, right. I, I think, I mean, yeah, you've put it really well. This is one of the concerns. So the piece that I wrote is partly a response to a piece that Matt Phillips, uh, Matt, Matt, yeah, Matt Hoover rather than Lee Phillips uh, wrote for Verso, right? Where it, it ends with basically a demand to do exactly what you've just described. So it shows you, despite them appealing to Marxism, they are, I think it's quite compatible with, with a kind of Biden labor policy. They just say build unions. And that in itself is not uh, a socialist or, or communist project, right? And that, that should be, we know that abstractly, right? So just having, you know, trade in, tra you know, the trade union consciousness, higher wages, more employment, that doesn't lead to a social revolution. And I, I don't think that they think it does, but there's no mechanism in that text of how more unionization actually leads to a social revolution, right? And so without that mechanism explained, without that sense, that strategy or theory of transition, I worry that what happens is the consequences are building stronger unions potentially in the global North for a kind of transition that is predicated on the exploitation of resources and labor in the global South and an intensification of borders to keep workers from the global South out of the global North, right? And people have written about those in different ways. Uh, I've previously published about it in terms of eco-apartheid, uh, which and I think that's an accurate description and an inadvertent consequence of the kind of class politics that doesn't see that class politics has to be a political class struggle and a social class struggle as well as an economic one. Otherwise, I think, yeah, you are being a kind of useful idiot for a fascist regime, right? And yeah, I, so yeah, I just, I agree. With right. you. Great, yeah, no, that's, I appreciate that. So, so yeah, let's get into degrowth a little bit. Sorry, I, I yeah, I did want to no. say that before we did, but yeah. Of course, so degrowth, yeah, the one of my key things on this is um, degrowth is often spoken about as if it is one thing and to an extent, you could say that it's, I will just say it's an umbrella term for a series of political perspectives that have some shared uh, ideas or bases. Those shared ideas are, I think, uh, moving away from GDP as a measure of economic progress, growth, right? That, that kind of anti-growth or the degrowth element comes in there. Second, uh, reductions in energetic and material throughput. So that just means reductions in the amount of energy that we use, more efficient use of energy. Uh, and an end to kind of um, excessive production and consumption of useless goods, right? So planned obsolescence, things like that, uh, the right to repair, those kinds of initiatives, right? So, that, so it's GDP, energetic and material throughput. And then the third is kind of the ideology of growth. So the idea that growth in itself is a good an unalloyed good that leads towards progress right why not why can't we just have something that's more like kind of um looking after our qualitative goods rather than quantitative ex expansion that's kind of what degrowth is i think uh, we can go into the history of where that comes from and how it emerges but what interests me is that from those three ideas don't lead to any intrinsic politics at all so in the degrowth handbook we edited, we were really careful to make this explicit, both in our foreword, but also in who we included. So there are anarchists in there who are talking about kind of horizontalist degrowth, degrowth, degrowth initiatives. Anarchists write about squats as an example of degrowth or um, land occupations as examples of degrowth or small scale agricultural initiatives, that kind of thing. Then you get uh, anti-imperialist and Marxist kinds of degrowth. So they're very different, but Kohei Sato, for example, uh, and Jason Hickel. Uh, I think also Stefania Barker with that kind of Marxist feminist degrowth. Then you get very liberal notions of degrowth that call for, say, work week or um, something like, you know, public transportation being free, those kinds of things. Uh, so those three things all sit under the notion of degrowth. They clearly have different class bases. Uh, they have different conceptions of the subject that will be organizing for degrowth. Um, so I just don't think it makes sense <laughs> to speak about them as a single and coherent political project, right? So one of the things that this Forget Eco-Modernism text tries to do is introduce those different positions, correct this idea of just being opposed to degrowth. I, I think we should be more granular. Uh, and I also try and praise uh, the convergence of degrowth with uh, Marxist thinking 
And one of the reasons I do that is because I am not a degrowth scholar. I'm not a proponent of degrowth. But many of the ideas in degrowth, especially the kind advanced by um, Jason Hickel, more recently, John Bellamy Foster as well, actually, has come out in favor of degrowth. Um, my cat is going to make an appearance in a second. She's going to turn up on screen. Uh, <laughs> and um, yeah, so the compatibility, I think, with degrowth with some of those ideas is to be welcomed. And what interests me about this is that many of the ideas that claim to be from degrowth are actually ideas that were already in the Marxist tradition, but specifically not in the global north. So if you read the 1992 uh, speech by Fidel Castro at Rio, he talks about an end to material consumption. He talks about how by allowing global south countries autonomous development, the global north will have to reduce its consumption. Right? That that is is we now think of that and we think, oh, it's degrowth. But you know, he was making these arguments prior to degrowth being as widely known as it is. Or Samir Armin and other dependency theorists who argue that um, for an articulated rather than disarticulated uh, autonomous uh, development for the global south, right? So national dependence, the right to self-development. Um, if you enable the global south to develop independently and not to serve the needs of consumers in the global north, that will necessarily lead to changes in social systems and production in the global north and consumption in the global north. So if you like, a consequence of these anti-imperialist third world Marxist traditions and perspectives is some kind of degrowth for the global north. Um, and so I think making that argument and, and being, you know, praising degrowth where it comes close to those anti-imperialist Marxist positions is something that I was interested in doing. Appreciate that. And that kind of gets into what I want to talk about a little bit next, which is that, um, you know, there this is also an area where I see um, there, this is a critique that people not a critique because critique implies that it's like more systemic than I think it is. But um, it's a criticism that you often see levied at folks that advocate um, pieces like yours work like Max Isles, other yeah. folks who are kind of engaging with these third world Marxist traditions and, um, you know, and degrowth is that one, like, this is a politics of less, um, you know, there's a, there's a, a move that people often make to sort of say, well, dependency theory has been debunked or um, unequal exchange has been debunked. Like these are, these are old conversations. We don't need to continue to have them. Yeah. Um, and then there's these sort of it's it's very interesting because it's like they, it's like um, they're like things that these folks think are sort of slurs like this is third worldism. This is, you know, um, <laughs> yeah. and um, and so, you know, I, I want to be clear because I also think that your piece and I don't think I, I think this about Max's work as well. Um, I don't think that your work um, says that there isn't an importance of the working class or, you know, people within the global north or, you know, um, doesn't it's a, it doesn't uh, totally askew that there's a responsibility and that there's a necessity for people to to organize and to, um, you know, which some people might charge third worldism, like the, the, the sort of, I guess, um, polemical argument against third worldism would be that it sort of relies only on subjects within the third world to be the revolutionary subjects of history, et cetera. And so that um, in some ways absolves us in the north of our responsibility to be um, engaged in particularly kind of mass struggle or uh, class struggle or things like this. Um, and so talk a little bit about this just mm -hmm. in terms of your 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 feelings your readings some of the things that you think these uh criticisms are totally wrong about or miss sure well the first thing i'm i quite i've had this a few times right so i've had it from the eco-modernist camp but a few others as well who wrote uh in these debates called called my position third worldist and you've kind of hit, uh implied it but on one level i quite welcome this because what I hear it saying is that uh, I have taken the time and effort, and it, it is effort and it's difficult because it's not part of the tradition that you're taught in the global north, but I've taken the time to read and take seriously Marxist revolutionaries thought emanating from the global south, right? And then 
incorporated that into the way that I, I think and the way I theorize and the way I think about struggle in the global north. Um, so if, yeah, I, <laughs> so I tend to think this only comes from people who haven't done that or are just disparaging towards those traditions in ways that I just think is unacceptable. So on one level, I'll take it. Um, I think it's really important to engage with that thought, but yeah, you're absolutely right that I'm not, I, I don't take that position where it's just like, oh, the global north working class can't do anything. It's the opposite of that. It's, I want to think very seriously about what is required of us in the global north to apply maximum leverage for working class emancipation. And the, my, the subject of that emancipation is a global working class. The majority of the working class do not, and popular classes in general, including peasantries, do not live in the imperial core. That, that should be obvious and taken for granted, right? And yet, um, Matt Huber's book, for example, uh, Climate Change of Class War, starts by saying in a footnote, oh, I'm only talking about the global North working class. I'm only talking about the US working class. My strategy doesn't go beyond that. I think that's a complete mistake. It's methodological nationalism. So what I try and do is think about the global working class and capacities for leverage and our responsibility in a global division of labor as workers in the global north. Um, so, I, yeah, I just think that this is what's required of all of us. And so, I'm, you know, I'm pleased there are people like, I think Max is especially good at this, at, at, at raising this question. And it demands a lot of, uh, a lot from workers in the global north, you know, so uh for example if down the road from me there is a thing called the samuelsby aerodrome and it's producing the fuel silage for every every f-35 bomber that is dropping bombs over palestine and gaza right now and those workers should not be working in that sector right and so it calls on us as workers in the global north to intervene disrupt challenge and blockade that factory as workers have been doing across this region regularly in an effort to try and raise consciousness of what it means to act in solidarity with working class struggles across the world. That's difficult because it means acting maybe not in our direct material interests is the way I would put this, right? It's not in my interest to get up really. Where it is on the, on the grand scheme, it's in my interest to get up at 5 a.m. and do this. But in the immediate term, it's quite, it's difficult, right? To, to go and do that work, but people are doing it. It's difficult to have to find employment outside of genocide reproducing industries, but they're going to have to do that for the sake of long-term emancipation of the working class. So I want to think seriously about that. And then, and of course, with the green transition, that yeah, it's much easier if we can just build our unions and grow, you know, <laughs> have this kind of eco-modernist transition, but this is not a solution for the global working class to be free. And it's just a case of pointing that out. Um, so in as far as I point that out and get called third worldist, that's fine with me right on uh it's fine with me too um <laughs> um so do you want to say a little bit more you mentioned at the beginning that you know palestine has been a big kind of is was part of the reason why you know you wanted to write this piece now um you just referenced obviously one example of 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 why and of our you know global north uh, thorough complicity across all kinds of uh, industries, which I think is something that people are really, um, I hate to use the term reckoning because it was so destroyed in 2020, but, um, you know, <laughs> having having a kind of reckoning with, uh, um, you know, around this on a, you know, and, and, and you know, thankfully, I, many people have taken action um, and many people have taken action also, as you're saying, against their immediate self-interest i mean you know students you know risking mm. future job possibilities and you know graduation and other things um to try to get their universities to divest from these in, you know from this killing machine and um so so there are, so there are people making those those decisions right now um but uh, yeah, so again, kind of connect those dots for us a little bit in terms of um, Palestine and why this piece now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the easy answer to this is just that I want to have the conversation that we're having and that, and that I don't, I, with more people, uh, and that I don't think eco-modernism can be part of that in this conjuncture. So 
um, I don't know how far back to go on this, but right. So I, I'm involved in various ways in conversations about the climate left in the UK. And we try and think about, you know, you have to think about the long arc of that movement and what it's looked like. Um, and so, in, you know, our story, obviously, as always, it's influenced by an intersection with the US. But you can think of that kind of period before COVID of the, the Green New Deal and the kind of hope in that in the US and the hope of a kind of Corbyn project here in, in the UK that came to an end and we need to learn and reflect on those lessons. And also right before COVID, we were looking at kind of uh, Fridays for Future and those kinds of, of programs, right? And then COVID happened and put, a, put everything that we've been building uh, around those movements on hold. Obviously, Corbynism was defeated. And so we were in a moment of introspection and we came out of the lockdown into a kind of in a new moment. And we've been, you know, up until Palestine, we've been thinking about what does that mean? How do we act on climate issues in the global north now, especially or especially in the UK, where we're going to get uh, a Labour government, but a Labour government that is social chauvinist is, you know, may as well be the right, the left flank of the Conservative Party. What does it mean to act in that space? And then in its own right, we should be fighting for Palestinian liberation. But the fact that <laughs> Palestinian liberation has emerged as a dominant tendency and trend now uh, means that we need to inflect our struggles with an anti-imperialist politics, right? And so I think what, all I would say is that like, we need to be having these conversations and finding ways to combine fighting for Palestinian liberation with environmental issues and that that work is happening rather than, you know, on the ground. So looking, I found a lot of hope in seeing climate groups coming to Palestine demos not just because they care about Palestine, but because they can understand that, for example, the military, like the US military is one of the largest <laughs> emitters of CO2 in the world, right? It's larger than Portugal in terms of its annual emissions. It's, it's mad how much it is. So shutting that down is a climate goal, but it's also a goal for Palestinian emancipation, liberation and solidarity. Watching the climate movement make those connections gives me hope. Uh, seeing the way that the movement in a way is well ahead of eco-modernism in its thinking in these terms. And I think ahead of places like Jacobin in general, right? This, I'm kind of riffing on what you've said now, but it gives me a lot of hope that like Ben Burgess can write a piece basically apologizing for the existence of Israel. And most of, uh, you know, the readership of Jacobin can go, no, like we're, we're anti-Zionists. Anti-Zionism requires something different to what Burgess outlines there. Like there, there are real advances happening in this space. Uh, yeah, that gives, <laughs> that gives me hope, right? And then the other bit to mention on that is like there, there are other ways of thinking about Palestine as an environmental issue that we, we could easily go into. Uh, one of those is the destruction of food systems, Palestinian sovereign food systems, which has been part of the genocide, but it's also preceded the genocide. So, you know, we should, I think, think about this genocide as part of an, ex an acceleration of an already existing genocidal practice uh, rather than something new. Uh, that involved um, destroying olive groves, destroying indigenous food systems and practices, disrupting universities, which try and deal with building climate resilient food systems for Palestinians. Uh, Israel is also involved in replacing uh, indigenous Palestinian ecosystems with more European appearing ecosystems, including types of trees that are more likely to be flammable, are less climate resilient. All of this is a, a project of apartheid. It's also a, a project of genocide, and it's also fundamentally against uh, building climate resilient food systems and ways of living. And so making those connections explicit through the Palestine issue is something that uh, I, I think we all need to be doing. Appreciate that a lot. Um, all right. So I'm going to pull in an audience question and kind of mm -hmm. combine it with one of mine because um, they're related. So. Um, Someone from the audience uh, asks, Kai, uh, I know you just debated Huber for pro cult. Uh, what do you think about his contentions? Seems he's moving right. Doesn't seem like his critique of degrowth has much um, understanding. Uh, my question was sort of similar, which is just like, you know, I'm curious of, you know, so of if you've had criticisms or responses that you feel like are substantial that warrant further um you know engagement elaboration um the stuff that i saw was just sort of people <laughs> you know it, getting their tweets off right and uh not really um 
again, not really engaging in, I, I don't know if it was, it might've been Huber actually that said something um, online that was of the, something along like, you know, you raise interesting points, but I'm more worried about creating the, um, you know, the, the class power, if we want to call it that, that's capable of enacting these things, then, um, then the things themselves is something, I mean, I'm, I'm mis, I'm, I'm not, I'm paraphrasing, but that was the gist yeah. of what I got out of his response. So anyways, yeah, to, to either of those points in terms of, um, contentions that you've had criticisms, et cetera. Sure. Yeah. I'll, I'll come back to the audience question in a second. Um, yeah, I've had a few bits of feedback, uh, critiqued from both sides, which I'm, if there are sides, which I'm quite pleased about. So uh, some degrowth friends and comrades are, I think, a bit frustrated that I don't identify it explicitly with degrowth. Um, and, you know, they, they see the gap between my position and their own as insignificant. I see it as quite appreciable and worth emphasizing. Um, and that's good, I think. I think it's just that has partly a lot to do with my trajectory to my political position and how I came here, which is through eco-Marxist and anti-imperialist work, whereas many younger people, I think, are coming to similar positions to my own through degrowth first. Uh, and so, you know, part of my job, I think, is to say, well, look, that's great. Here are a bunch of other people from the global south who are already thinking along these terms, people like Sankara, Cabral, you know, the Dependency School, Samir Amin, Abdul Malik, pointing them in those directions, uh, I think is important. Um, so yeah, so degrowth is just like, why, why, why won't you just call yourself a degrowther? Like, <laughs> but I, I, I don't know, I don't take that too seriously. You know, the who, how you identify matters much less to me than who I would be organizing with or fighting with. And those people I'd be organizing and fighting with. And I think they would agree with that. Then I had some interesting feedback from, that will they'll stick in, I hope, will frustrate eco-modernists, which is that I had uh, trade unionists get in touch with me saying that they welcomed the piece because it gave them a language to speak about social chauvinism in their movements that they previously hadn't had. So I've not mentioned social chauvinism yet in this conversation. It's the, basically the idea that a kind of nationalist version of class politics that believes in the right for, say, you know, uh, imperialist powers to exploit other powers. So. And they were like, yeah, this language is really useful for us, in part because we're struggling to move beyond just economic class struggles towards political and social struggles. And especially in light of Palestine, we want to be doing more work as trade unions around Palestine. I think that's fantastic, right, that people are thinking on those terms. Um, so that feedback was probably my favorite piece that I've had. And then uh, a lot of people just being like, like I am, like <laughs> tired of the debate, <laughs> I think. Uh, being like, glad you've written that, but uh, hopefully this will be the end of it. Like hopefully we can get on to the, the organizing, which maybe then comes over to the comment that I think that you've mentioned. I think it was Matt who said that, like, you know, I'm not interested in these things. I'm more interested in mobilizing. So am I, but the whole point of that piece is that I'm worried about the people that Matt's potentially mobilizing with and who he's speaking to, again, by writing for places like Unheard, or increasingly, I think, Jacobin, that are social chauvinist, if not outright conservative in orientation. Um, so yeah, I wanna get onto organizing work too. Uh, the audience question on Matt, yeah, moving right, I think. Uh, they added just a little bit here, which might might help uh, in the response, but just says, okay. seems like his contention is working class people won't care about mitigating climate change if it means their general well-being changes or that their material conditions worsen. And this is a classic kind of one version of a sort of Marxist argument, right, is that like people have to see that fighting these things actually improves their material conditions rather than causes them to decline, right? Yeah, which I just, I mean, on one level, it's historically not true. So I live in Lancashire, so I'm always going to bring up this. It's an older example, but there are plenty of new examples too. But Lancashire cotton workers refused to work cotton picked by slaves because they wanted to stand in solidarity against slavery, right? They wanted the abolition of slavery in the United States. It was not in their material and economic interests in that moment to do it, but they recognized the moral importance of that. And while I'm not going to say that all of our politics hinges on morals, I think it is guided by our material interests. We should recognize that people sometimes do things against their immediate interests because they realize it's the right thing to do. 
And I, I think not keeping that in mind is just leaves you with a really diminished sense of why human beings do the things that they do, to put it basically, right? So it's while claiming to defend the working class, that kind of position belittles the working class, diminishes who they are uh, and, and what motivates them in a similar way to kind of mainstream economics that believes that we're all just rational, economic, self-interested individuals, right? So I think it's interesting that it borrows that kind of same conception of who a worker is. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so that's one thing that annoys me about that. But I guess uh, what else on that? And the, yeah, the protocol debate, how do I feel about it? So sorry to talk about another podcast on, on your show, but it's in two, it's in two parts. Um, I, it's I fine hope... to talk about other podcasts. It's <laughs> All right. Just like brand identity. But it's, I think, I, I'm a, I hope that debate, or it was a non-debate. I didn't want, at that stage, I didn't want to debate Huber. My thinking around eco-modernism was that it is more useful to articulate a different position, a uh, position that is unapologetically Marxist, communist, anti-imperialist, and show its differences to an eco-modernist position, and then essentially let, let an audience decide between them, right? And so that, that's the approach I took uh, with Matt in that discussion. I, I think it was probably the right way to go, but it also meant letting things pass in our conversation that I really wanted to, <laughs> to fight back on. But I was like, no, that's just, it's enough to say that that's a difference, you know, and then let others decide. But again, um, this was, I think, it, I think it was recorded before Palestine, it was recorded, you know, a while ago now. And so the conditions of struggle have changed. And I think that the, the, the direction that that politics is going in is, I've already said this, but it's fundamentally dangerous. Appreciate that. Um, I wanted to bring up um, for a couple of reasons. I mean, one, uh, Jody Dean, um, mm -hmm. as hopefully all of our listeners know already, um, you know, I think there's a petition out there that you can you can sign. Yes. Um, so definitely do that. But um, she was suspended. And I think that I mean, Vijay Prashad was on yesterday. He talked about that. There's fear that she's going to be terminated or that's what they want to mm -hmm. do. Um, and so uh, you know, for folks who don't know, she's a professor, she's, you know, an organizer, a party member, etc. Um, and you two co-wrote a piece a little while ago. Um, I don't know exactly the date, but um, on climate Leninism. And mm -hmm. within that, you're thinking a lot about uh, questions that we brought up already about kind of transition and revolution and, um, you know, also what it will take to bring about the types of transition that you know, make a planet livable. And I, I do want to bring this back to a point you just made too, because I also think a lot of times the discussion around declining material uh, interests, is, as somebody said in the audience, it, it tends to be based on, um, you know, ideas of consumption and consumerism yeah. rather than like at the value of having your child grow up in a planet where they have breathable air and can get food and all of these kind of things, which are material. Um, yeah. And so... Um, anyway, talk a little bit about that work around, uh, climate Len Leninism and anything you want to say about kind of your work with Jody. Sure. Um, quickly onto that point from the audience. I'm sorry I missed that question or that part, that comment. Um, that's absolutely right. Right. So this idea that, um, <laughs> it's against working class interest to fight for something like a, like degrowth. If I occupy that degrowth position for a second also implies that uh, working class interests are capitalist interests and nothing other than that. So, you know, the, the very idea of a politics of less that they use as a cudgel against degrowth just means a politics of less consumption in capitalist horizons and frameworks. The whole point of degrowth and of eco-socialism, as I understand it, is a qualitative improvement in people's lives, right? That uh, That's an important shift and something that I, I think one of the reasons why this debate is exhausting is that it just has been diminished to a series of slogans so a politics of less or this is just austerity and that's just fundamentally not what it is and if anyone has read any of the degrowth literature they would know that um so yeah i'm glad that the audience is picking up on that then on jody just quickly um yeah it would be remiss not to say this if if you haven't seen the petition there is a petition going around um please sign it you can sign i think you can find it quite quickly on social media uh or we can link to it it starts by saying that, you know, concerned scholars, but please anyone, just everyone sign it. Uh, it's an important petition. 
it's also a significant it's a significant case for several reasons uh one is you know she was speaking out in favor of palestine palestine and palestinian resistance um it's been framed as a issue around free speech and the right to speak freely but we should recognize it's, it's much worse than that because the university has recognized jody's right to free speech but it is going after her on the basis of title six um which is something different to do with discrimination and safety uh but Basically, this is trying to wrap up the language of safety as a way of removing pro-Palestine solidarity in university systems. And if that's allowed to stand, it sets an extremely dangerous precedent for people siding with Palestine all across the university system in the US and beyond. So keep an eye on that case, support Jody. Uh, all of our interests are, are her interests in this. And we, yeah, we have to back her on that. Um, Right. Yeah. I'll just say quickly before you get into that, that I did uh, drop the petition in the chat. So folks, you can, you know, please do go ahead and and um, sign it, share it. Um, and then just to respond to this, Colin. So I she's she's at uh, she was at Hobart and or she is at Hobart and William mm -hmm. Smith Colleges, um, which I don't think is SUNY. Um, but no, it's actually... Hobart William Smith. I used to work with Jody. <laughs> so yeah. Hobart William Smith College is in upstate New York. It's in a little town called Geneva. It's a, a liberal arts college there. Um, she hasn't been fired. She's been suspended from teaching duties um, pending an investigation. So that's the state of where we're at. And any and all support is welcome. There are a couple of, you can obviously read her pieces on the Verso blog. And there have been a couple of pieces written, written I think, in uh, Middle East and I and a few others about her case, if you want to get up to speed on what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just share too, like uh, the piece is good that she wrote that she got suspended for. And it, she says a lot of things that I have said many times on this podcast. So fortunately, I'm not in academia and no one can come after me. But um, <laughs> well, that's not true. People can come after me, but I'm not in <laughs> academia. Um, but uh, but yes, so I, I would just say that, yeah, it is. It's a good piece. And uh, it's unfortunate that, um, yeah, that she was she's being punished for that expression. And hopefully folks can sign and, and overturn that. But yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Continue. Yeah, no, of course. And many of us, I should say, have faced repression in various ways. So in the early days of this, I was investigated uh, at my university and I'm not the only one. There were friends of mine were named in the Times in the UK. Um, it's, it's a prolonged project of trying to silence solidarity with Palestine. Um, yep. So in every, in every case, support people when they, they uh, experience this. I can't even remember what the question was about the climate leninism and stuff. Do you want me to talk? What is it? What's uh, it about? <laughs> yeah yeah so that was basically it. it was just kind of like you know you have this piece it talks about transition and, and revolution yeah. and and so just kind of give an overview of the argument you're making there sure um yeah the piece is interesting because i think we'd, we'd maybe write it differently now but in, in essence the piece was trying to argue for uh one of we're one of a group of people trying to think about lenin and leninism and revitalizing leninism uh in light of the climate crisis and so what does a kind of Leninist politics bring to our understandings of the climate crisis uh, that are maybe missing from other movements and other perspectives? So we've written two pieces on this with slight differences of focus. Um, but the one you're talking about, yeah, we focus very much on transition and what kind of consequence or theory of transition is contained in various environmental strategies. So I think we mentioned the Green New Deal in that and the limits of a Green New Deal politics. Uh, we go through stuff like Extinction Rebellion and those kinds of, you know, demanding a capitalist state to just do the right thing and why that's limited. Uh, we go through groups like uh, communization theory, which kind of denies the problem of transition altogether. It's the idea that we'll have immediate communizing tendencies and practices without a transitionary period. Uh, and we say, we need to think very seriously about transition, that moment of transition that uh, is contingent, open, always reversible, uh, that doesn't end with a kind of dramatic moment of seizing power, but instead is a protracted process of building socialism after the revolution, something that you know Lenin was acutely aware of when you read his work. And so we, we want more attention to that, to the problem of transition conceptually, um, but also kind of empirically in our movements and our struggles. And there are groups now picking this up and taking it forward. So in the UK, we have a, a group called Climate Vanguard who are worth following. Even if you're not in the UK, they do a lot of political education work around climate and transition. 
um, trying to think about that and making an argument as we did for something like a party, the necessity of a party in this moment um, and the necessity of taking the state seriously as a terrain of struggle. So that's pretty much what those pieces were doing. Um, and it's been really, um, really nice to see the uptake and response to those. There's a, a lot of uh, positive feedback, some, some of course, critical, you know, raising the, the, the moniker of Lenin is, you know, unacceptable for many, but in any case, it's been good to see that. But we also, the other bit we do in that is to situate Lenin, as I've been doing all the way through this talk, and the Leninist tradition is not just Lenin, but of uh, third world struggles that were informed by Lenin and Leninism. So, yeah, I think that's an important move. People like Andreas Mom have also written about an eco-Leninism or climate Leninism. But I think for him, it's more narrowly conceived as just Lenin's thought. And we wanted to argue that that's not quite right. Right? We need to pay attention to the influence Lenin has had on various movements and thinkers, people like Walter Rodney or Samir Amin or Amakar Cabral, those kind of names. Um, yeah, so that's what that is. Uh, we're still continuing this work, I think, slowly, trying to think about transition and struggles around transition. One of the things we're thinking about a lot at the moment is, are we in a new, do we need, how do you think about imperialism today? Like what is, what theory of imperialism do we need to make sense of the way capital accumulates in this moment of ecological collapse? And in this moment that people like, uh, Robert Brenner have described as a situation of, say, overcapacity, right, and on the ground, on the global scale. Um, yeah, so we continue to do that work. Uh, and I can plug one of Jodie's forthcoming books at the same time, might as well, Comrade uh, Under Fire. So she's just, she's written a book forthcoming on uh, neo-feudalism, which whether or not uh, you agree with the neo-feudalist hypothesis is, is extremely interesting in the way that capital is reorganizing and transforming itself. Uh, in this present moment. And so I hope that will continue those conversations that we've started as well. Right on. Um, I'm going to pull up a couple more or at least one more question from the mm -hmm. audience. Um, let's see, did we get to let me check ours too? Um, yeah, I have one more from me too. So yeah. Uh, so Alex asks, what should principled Marxists, Leninists, communists, those are all slashes, um, anti-imperialist climate organizing, in the global north look like do you have some some thoughts oh on this <laughs> <laughs> that's a big question that's a that's it's, a book right there it, it is yeah and it, i mean it's a book i would i think i'm hoping hoping to work on a little bit over this summer we'll see how it goes but um you know what so i get asked this question quite a bit i guess in one version or another and i'm going to give my cheap answer but i think it's also a serious answer so basically what you're asking me is what is to be done the Lenin question. And my usual response to that is I, to reply in the abstract is meaningless. What's more interesting is to ask how many of you are there? So if, if you're in a party or in a small group in a city, um, this your answer to this question starts with how many of you are and what kind of leverage you can apply, given who you are of your skills and capacities to further a project towards global emancipation, right? Not just towards emancipation for you and your immediate interests. I think that's the kind of abstract. So how many of you, I can't just answer it, you know, join the party, build a party. That's not it. It's like, if there's no point joining a party if you're the only member of that party in your town, it's obvious. So what can you do where you are? Um, and that will be a personal question. And I think one of the things we need to do is get good at thinking about how, where maximum leverage can be applied. Very often, good work is already being done where you are. So I would say another thing is um, a radical openness to joining movements and actions that you may not fully agree with. You might think ideologically you're not perfectly aligned, but nobody cares about your perfect ideological alignment. People care about having a livable world and having strong communities of workers that can fight back, right? And so join what's already happening, <laughs> step one. Think about where else leverage can be applied. Step two, I think. I like that a lot. Um, all right. Well, maybe this will be quick. Uh, I'm going to pull this up. It was an earlier question about can we address the problems with Aaron Bastani's fully automated luxury communism at some point? I think we kind of did that throughout this conversation. But if you want to say anything specific about this. Yeah. 
I mean, <laughs> I don't know where to start with this. <laughs> there's so much, there's so much wrong with this concept uh, and this idea. I, let me go back to where, where that came from originally. That might be more interesting. Uh, and then I can go to what's wrong with it. I was a part of the movements um, that, notion, that came up with this idea or was one of the milieus where this notion of luxury communism emerged. So we might associate it with Bastani, um, but it wasn't Bastani. As with many of these things, this notion of luxury communism was a product of social struggles and movements and discussions. And at the time, this is post-austerity in the UK, we were trying to think about how do you create a kind of vision of communism that people don't associate with being austere with the kind of what liberal ideology tells you is the Soviet Union, queuing up for your basics and fundamentals, right? How do we make uh, a vision of communism that is uh, desirable, exciting, vibrant? Uh, we were involved in this with people, with people like Mark Fisher, who uh, wrote a book, Capitalist Realism, before he tragically passed away. He was working on a book called Acid Communism. that was all part of the same milieu of trying to basically make a new notion of communism that meant abundance for everybody through common ownership, that meant living a good and better life, the kind of things we now think about as being part of degrowth, but were not at that time anything to do with degrowth. So that was what luxury communism was, right? And it, it didn't really mean, it didn't have anything much to do with automation. If it did, it was kind of tongue in cheek because we were reading people like Antonio Negri and the autonomists and the kind of social factory theses and those kinds of things. And then somehow that kind of very serious thinking about what would it mean to make a desirable vision of, of communism gets wrapped up into this notion of fully automated luxury communism uh, that I basically have no time for. And I don't think the author of, I don't think Bastani does anymore. I think he's moved on to a far more kind of how do we persuade centrist dads to vote for social democrats kind of politics that that's fine but that's that's not a social project um and just i mean i can rattle off the frustrations uh, you know full, full automation is an impossibility if it's even desirable uh, what about reproductive care and labor you know these critiques have been made by feminists already i don't think i need to go there and the idea of space mining is just like again ecologically illiterate and shares a lot of terrain with eco-modernism um, but yeah, I just, I, I mean, I don't see this book having any influence in social struggles or movements anymore. So in a way, let's just hope it doesn't get reprinted. Right on. Um, when he's not, uh, calling, uh, or showing the police the location of Palestinian organizers, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Uh, additionally, uh, so as we mentioned at the beginning, you're, you're one of the editors of the, the degrowth handbook, which De Gruyter, uh, published. So do you want to talk a little bit about that project, uh, mm -hmm. before we close? I mean, I think it's, it's a, it's an extensive, uh, book. It's, it's one, I mean, I'll just say pricing wise for the audience. Like it's one probably try to get, try to get your library to purchase or yeah. access it through your university or things like that, or, you know, look for a, a free copy floating around somewhere. But, um, but it certainly engages in a lot of discussion around degrowth, obviously. So talk a little bit about that. I mean, I think it's interesting in some ways, cause you're also saying that you don't see yourself right now as wanting to, um, you know, claim the banner of degrowth, even though you're certainly willing to struggle with those folks. Um, so, you know, yeah, say a little bit about the the book, though. Sure. Um, firstly, it's definitely available for free in all uh, good piracy outlets or through comrades and friends. Uh, the price point is prohibitive, and we tried to raise enough money through our universities to make it open access, but unfortunately, we we couldn't muster those funds and. That's ironic, given that the book is about degrowth, obviously, and it stings, but that, that's where we're at. Um, the book was going to have a subtitle of Propositions and Prospects. So we kind of saw degrowth, both of us, it's, it's me and someone called Lauren Eastwood, a good friend, comrade, we both identify as Marxists more than we do as, as degrowth. But we recognize that degrowth is making really useful contributions. Uh, engaging with it has been fruitful for us and our own thinking. And we were asked to put this together and it looked like a good opportunity to do some of that work more. Um, and to make a claim, the claim I've already made on this call, which is that degrowth isn't really a politics. It's a series of what we call propositions and prospects. 
uh, propositions about what a kind of sustainable planet would be. So again, moving away from GDP, reductions in material and energetic throughput, moving away from growth being associated with progress. Um, so those are the propositions. Prospects, well, what are the prospects of degrowth actually mobilizing movements? Something that we haven't discussed and that I think is important. You know, I think um, degrowth proponents as well as its critics have made the point that degrowth is not a very <laughs> attractive title to the average person on the street. People like Jason Hickel, I think, have said that degrowth is the strategy, but eco-socialism is the politics and the goal, right? And that's quite a nice way of thinking about it. Um, but yeah, what are the prospects of a degrowth transition of any kind? Uh, what is the prospect of a four-day work week in the global north, if you want to take that more liberal approach? And so we tried to build a book around those ideas. And then we tried to fill a few other holes as well. So a lot of degrowth scholarship is written about urban environments, but very little is about rural environments. So, and I work on agriculture and rurality a lot. So I wanted a section in there about that. So we have a section on urban rural divides and degrowth. Then there's the question of whether degrowth uh, is compatible to, with the, for the global south. Is it a project for the global south? Or might it be a project that is only relevant to the global north, but that has resonances with the global south? And so we have a section with conversations around that. Uh, we have a section on kind of critical engagements with degrowth. So there we have people who are maybe degrowth or degrowth adjacent, challenging some of its ideas. Uh, there's a good essay in there, for example, arguing that a lot of um, eco-feminist literature was already arguing what degrowth was, arguing. Um, but the degrowth kind of obscured that, doesn't reference it sufficiently. And that's That was a really useful piece. And then in, there's an opening section, I think, that's just, you know, some core questions for degrowth. Like, what about money? <laughs> is, de is money in a degrowth future? Yeah, that's something that hasn't been discussed too much. Or what is the, actually, if you bracket the whole uh, claim to modernity that eco-modernism has in that name, are there elements of modernism and modernity that might be relevant and useful for a degrowth project? Um, that was another thing that we had in there. So, yeah, it was, a, it was. That's the kind of the structure of the book. I hope it's useful. Besides the fact that it's prohibitively expensive for some, and for me, it was just a useful working through of, of degrowth, coming to understand it more, um, engage with it, think about, think with and alongside it. Right? I think. It's obvious, but we should be reading stuff that we don't agree with. And it's it's really quite strange to me that I am uh, thought of as a degrowth proponent because I edited a handbook of degrowth. But in the introduction, we say we are not degrowth proponents, but we recognize its use right in various ways. Um, one more thing tangentially to that for the guests. The other the other reason for not being a degrowth proponent is that I think it conceptually and analytically. It's quite an impoverished way of critiquing capitalism. So growth is a very flat concept. And every time I explain it, I have to go through these three things that degrowth is opposed to. Whereas I think Marxism, the theory of value, theories of divisions of labor, notions of imperialism, uh, capital, right? Just in capital accumulation, what is capital? It's a social relation, right? It's not just a metric of GDP. And in fact, GDP, conceals how value is produced on the global stage. All of that you get from Marxism. Um, and so, yeah, I think uh, degrowth is very useful, but come editing that book really helped me understand where it falls short as well. Super, super appreciate that. Um, and all of your, you know, um, your thoughts and comments here today. I look forward to future conversations with you and, you know, hopefully some of your colleagues, etc. Um, before we go, is there anything that, that you want to, um, you know, say or, or share or close with? Uh, yeah, I'm going to reiterate the need to support Jody. It's on my mind uh, a lot. So let's support the Columbia students and other students across the US, however you can. I'm sure there'll be legal support funds there are legal support funds you can you know um donate to uh there are other ways of getting involved in those go down and help them directly if you're able to uh please sign the petition uh for jody um yeah and i i mean if yeah any other that's i think i'd leave it there that's good for me <laughs> Well, thank you so much for your time. Um, I'm going to let you go at this point and just say a, a few things in closing to our audience. But I really appreciate uh, this conversation and uh, and your work. So thank you.
Thanks, Jared. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Same. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so folks, I just wanted to say a couple things before we close. So just say, uh, one, very much appreciate that conversation. Um, two, we, uh, tomorrow, no, we have a day off tomorrow, uh, so I can get some other work done, but on Thursday, we have two conversations coming. One was just added to the, um, the slate this morning officially. So First, in the morning at 10 a.m., we will have Two Black and Rasul Moat to talk about their book, Laundering Black Rage. Um, so very much look forward to that. Always enjoy being in conversation with Two Black. And um, I'm looking forward to being in conversation with Rasul for the first time. Um, and so definitely tune into that. And then in the evening, well, yeah, in the evening Eastern time at 7.30, PM here, um, we will have a conversation that will be on encampments and occupations, and we'll be talking to organizers from um, the Howard University occupation of 2018, which held the administration building for 11 days, got a bunch of demands met. Um, we'll talk about that and about the difficulty also of getting those demands actualized after the encampment is done. Um, and then we also will talk with a couple of folks who were a part of, uh, Occ the Occupy movement, but specifically in Oakland and specifically the, I believe the group that, uh, that sort of branched off and became Decolonize Oakland. Um, so we'll talk about that as well. And we will also talk about a couple, talk with a couple of organizers who were a part of the massive encampments in Philadelphia in 2020 that were a part of um you know leveraging a, a bunch of houses actually from you know the government local and and nationally um for uh for people who were houseless right and so um it's just going to be uh i think hopefully a very invigorating discussion with some veteran organizers who um have experience with that type of struggle with uh you know winning demands in some cases of that type of struggle and with all of the contradictions and challenges of those spaces, but also, um, you know, the politicizing value of them, the very real um, possibility of, of winning and things like that. And so hopefully um, folks will tune into that. And obviously there's a ton of, it just keeps growing in terms of the number of encampments that are now going on related to Palestine. And I think that that is a, a positive um, development, whatever limitations those uh, spaces may have, those are people who are getting directly involved in, um, you know, the struggle and we support them and we hope that they win. So, um, yeah, free Palestine, um, stop the genocide on Gaza and, and all of that. So thanks again, folks. Um, this has been, uh, I really appreciate this conversation today with Kai and look forward to talking to him more in the future as well.